night. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. We have Fran Hutchins, who is the director of Back Cons and International Skin Preserve. Um, Fran has been with BCI since 2006, directing educational programs and the restoration work on BCI's Bracken Cave Preserve while working with Texas landowners protecting other bat roosts and leading WNS cave survey projects. His work at the preserve protects the largest colony of bats in the world. That's amazing. He is often asked to speak at various events, sharing his passion for informing the public about bats. This extends to schools, zoos, and organizations from around the world. He has been featured on Texas Country Reporter, Travel Channel, Texas Highway Magazine, several documentaries, as well as Science Friday. He has been appointed to the Seek Wildlife Diversity Advisory Committee. In 2013, he was recognized by the U.S. Forest Service for Wings Across the Americas, Bats Live Education Program. Fran is also a caver, a Texas master naturalist, woohoo, and an Eagle Scout. Um, so again, for those of you just joining us, thank you for, for coming along with us for this. We are going to be recording this program and uploading it onto our YouTube page subsequently. So if you could please uh, mute and stop the video um, on, on your part, that will, uh, that will help us stay focused on, on Fran's talk. So Fran, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, everybody, we'll go ahead and uh, get the screen shared. <clears throat> uh, can you see uh, the screen? Good. All right. So we'll get started here. Mm -hmm. Again, I want to thank everybody for spending their evening with me and uh, to learn about uh, Bracken Cave and our bats. Um, I've got, uh, we're going to do th three little pieces. One will be just a little bit of information about Bat Conservation International, kind of who we are. And, uh, and after each segment, there'll be a short pause in case there's some questions. So uh, you can let it have, and Amanda will help uh, get those questions to me and uh, we'll try to get them all answered. And then we're going to talk about the preserve itself. And then we're going to end with talking about the Mexican free tail bats that uh, live in the cave. So the, um, but uh, at uh, Bat Conservation International, we're, um, let me get to make sure this is working. All right. There we go. Oh, okay, good. The, um, but uh, it's really short and sweet. Our mission is to end bat extinctions worldwide. Uh, we've been uh, trying to do this for 39 years. We're based out of Austin, Texas. Uh, we work in 97 different countries and we've been protecting a Bracken cave itself uh, for 29 years now. Um, so it's, uh, it, we're just a, a bunch of passionate, crazy bat people that are really passionate about our jobs and um, protecting bats all over the world. Uh, part of that is with um, endangered species inter interventions. Uh, for example, uh, we've got a big project going on in South Florida with the Florida bonneted bat and protecting that endangered species. Uh, purchasing, we were in the process of purchasing a couple caves in Jamaica to protect uh, J J Jamaican flowered bat. There's only a couple of hundred of them left and they only live in, in one, one of these caves. Uh, so different projects like that. And for more information about what we're doing worldwide, you can always go to our website, batcon.org, uh, and get more information about these different projects that we're working on. We also um, spend a lot of time looking at uh, different scalable research solutions. Um, and for example, with white nose syndrome, um, trying to come up with some ways uh, to protect our bats from this uh, this really terrible fungus that's killing millions of bats all over the United States. And um, wind, wind uh, energy is another issue with uh, killing bats and birds. 
and we have a big scholarship program for our, a lot of our international students. So lots of different projects, uh, research projects that we have going on. And also, you know, on a landscape level, lots of protection of uh, landscape. For example, our agave restoration project, we're, uh, our goal in the next 10 years is to plant over a million agave plants throughout Mexico and, and Southern United States, West Texas. Uh, so different projects like that to uh, be out on the, on, on the landscape uh, doing our work and it also includes the work we do at uh, Bracken Cave Preserve. And then also just in, inspiring um, future generations to protect um, our bats and, and, and get an appreciation of, um, of why they need to be protected uh, through our, what we do at Bracken Cave Preserve. And we also have our bat walks program that we're roll, rolling out throughout the United States uh, to um, get people involved with the bats just in their local communities. Um, so uh, I have a, a little stopping point here if anybody has any questions about Bat Conservation International specifically. If not, we can move on. Um, we don't, we don't right now, okay. um, but um, and there'll be there'll be other breaking points and then of course when we're done there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers so like i said if you have a question write it down or chat type type it out in the chat room and uh, that way uh, amanda has it and we can uh, get the answers for you so we're well, next thing we're so we're going to focus on bracken, bracken cave preserve and we're going to start off with like all right where are we um and we're just right up the street here in San Antonio, just 20 miles away. You can see where the little white arrow is, just uh, near the Garden Ridge area. We're right along the border between Bear County and Comal County. Uh, we have uh, 1,500 acres um, that we've been uh, protecting. Uh, we started out with just five acre footprint of the cave uh, back in um, 1992. That's what the little green box is on your slide. And now we're um, up to 1,500 acres, and we got an additional uh, 2,000 acres that we co-manage with the Nature Conservancy. So between the two organizations, there's 3,500 acres that's being protected mm -hmm. right there along the Comal River or Comal Creek. There in, um, I mean, the Cibolo Creek in Comal County, uh, to protect the uh, that habitat. The um, Let's see here. So part of what we're do protecting on the preserve, just to start off with, is the recharge zone for our aquifer. Uh, very important area, so it's the drinking water for um, San Antonio, New Braunfels, that area. We're also uh, protecting uh, habitat for our golden chick warblers, which is an endangered uh, migratory songbird that, um, comes in from Central America. And of course, we're protecting Bracken Cave with the home to the largest colony of bats in the world. So those three um, component are basically the three biggest components that we have on the preserve and part of our mission there. Um, and it involves uh, a number of different op projects, which we'll talk about briefly. So this to kind of give you an uh, landscape layout there the, you know it's, we're part of the Edwards Plateau region uh, there it's really karsty uh, Bracken cave was not the only cave on the property um, the uh, it's you know uh, we have the steep canyons it's an oak juniper woodlands mix we have patches of grasslands here and there uh, we got the hackberry escarpment cherry mesquite sumac cactus a little bit of everything um, uh, a lot of your understory trees, most of you are familiar with as master naturalists, your uh, Texas persimmon, agarita, evergreen sumac, just to name a few. Um, so it's, it's for those of you that are doing volunteer work in the, in the hill country, you're really familiar with this terrain uh, and the topography. The, um, you know, as far as with the, uh, the hill country, uh, we've got a little bit of everything, uh, 124 species of birds, 
um, including our endangered species, the uh, golden shake warblers, everything from ringtail cats uh, to porcupines, armadillos, have a pack of coyotes, um, the uh, assortment of all the different critters out there, uh, even up in the top right, right hand corner, exchange students. Um, that was uh, Chang's first um, marshmallow. Uh, so he got it all over himself. The um, also the uh, you know wild turkey. Of course, we have our issues with our feral hogs and and uh, and the dealing with um, those invasive species, uh, our titmouse, uh, so all kinds of butterflies, white-tailed deer. So, and most of the things that you would expect to see in um, in your Texas Hill Country landscapes, we have on the preserve, and of course, those evil Texas mosquitoes there that uh, will bite through your shirts. The, um, so to get a sense of uh, the property and what we're do working on. So we have areas where we have uh, our gold chick warbler habitat that we're managing, um, as well as we're managing some of our habitat for um, our black cat burial, and uh, which are two totally different habitats uh, that we're managing for uh, fire is a um, big tool that we use um, on the preserve. Uh, 2019, we were able to burn um, 200 acres. Uh, so some of the work that we do includes removing old fences, which really fragments the landscape. Uh, so we go through and we do uh, that. We get a lot of that work done with our volunteers between uh, Boy Scouts, uh, other school groups, master naturalists, uh, come out to the preserve and help us with a number of different projects. Uh, but, and then, we're, you know, some places we're in there with uh, doing dozer work, <coughs> a lot of chainsaw work and that kind of thing. In some areas, we're removing the cedar uh, for these grassy open spaces. And in other areas, we're just going in to um, thin out the juniper to uh, allow for that uh, uh, warbler habitat to, uh, to just get better and better. And also thinning it out helps getting some of that sunlight into those areas and uh, increases the diversity. Uh, so we don't end up in the, with those cedar breaks that are just basically cedar trees and, and nothing else able to live in there. Um, the, uh, so here, this is what all the hub hubs about. This is a shot of Bracken Cave. Um, and it actually is this green right now with all the rainfall we've had in the last month and a half. Um, everything is nice and green. Um, but uh, it, this is a maternity colony for our Mexican free tail bats. And we'll do a deeper dive into the Mexican free tail bats and, and them here in, in, in a few minutes. Um, Give you a sense of the cave. This is a lidar uh, scan, both a surface and uh, underground scan of the a cave profile of the cave. So you can um, see here on the where the sinkhole is. Uh, so from the mouth of the cave to the very back of the cave is 650 feet. Um, it's 124 feet wide. Whoops, I went the wrong way. 124 feet wide at the floor. Um, floor to ceiling, we're 117 feet. Uh, there's basically two rooms. You can see this white light spot right here. That's a, a large breakdown pile collapsed from the ceiling. And so it's, uh, there's a little bit of a blockage there. It blocks about two thirds of the passage. And then we have the very, very back room of the cave. Um, one of the uh, things that this doesn't show is how deep the guano is in the cave. The guano is, um, we've been able to measure down about 75 feet. So we have uh, over 75 feet of guano that's accumulated over the last 10,000 years um, in the cave. Uh, the environment in the cave is, um, unlike most caves in the area, most caves you go into, it's usually a nice 68, 72 degrees year round. Uh, Bracken, 
is 104 degrees uh, most of the time, most of the year, pretty much from March through November, while the bats are roosting in the cave. Um, and then during the winter months, it gets down, might get down into the 70s, 80s. Um, but the uh, and uh, the air, as you can imagine, with millions of bats living in the cave, the environment in there is, is pretty much lethal to humans. The um, methane, ammonia levels, CO2 levels, which are heavier gases that concentrate down near the floor. We have to wear special breathing gear uh, to go into the cave. And then um, we also have uh, the, um, our, what we call our housekeeping, it's dermestid flesh-eating beetles. So the floor of the cave is covered um, with, it just basically moves. The beetles are so thick on the floor of the cave and um, they eat anything that uh, falls onto the floor of the cave. They eat the bats, they eat the bat poop or, or any other animals that would wander into the cave. Um, they just swarm all over and start stop eating them. So very uh, dynamic uh, micro ecosystem inside the cave. It's kind of like a uh, like a moonscape in there. This is a shot of, of, of the front room of the cave. So um, when you're walking around in the guano, um, you only you only don't sink too much more than your knees. Um, if you wanted to watch a good video clip of being inside the cave, you could go on YouTube and uh, dirtiest Mike Rose dirtiest jobs. He shot his pilot show out at Bracken and. Uh, we had him thrashing around in the guano. He lost his boot and all that fun stuff. So if you want to kind of get a sense of what it's like on the inside, uh, you could see that. The, um, let's see. So uh, we're going to take a short break here to talk about, see if there's any questions so far that have come up. Um, just talking about the preserve itself. Do we, have any um, we don't have any questions right now, um, okay. but I do want to remind everyone that you're welcome to use the chat, uh, the chat icon. Um, if you have any questions coming up during the talk, just go ahead and write those out in the chat, and I'll make sure that they make it to Fran. But you can start writing them out whenever you like. So, but I guess for now we can just press on. Okay, that'll work. So the um, so now we're going to talk about Mexican free tail bats. Um, they're a um, the official state flying mammal for Texas. Um, this is a picture of one. You got a picture. Of the picture in the glove is actually um, from uh, last week. That's a juvenile. Uh, so that bat is about uh, five and a half, six weeks old. It's just started flying. So. They, they range from a dark brown to a really dark, almost blackish gray color. You can see how broad their ears are. Um, it is the most common bat that we have in Texas. They are living in all kinds of different roosts. Uh, they like man-made structures. So we do see them uh, a lot uh, throughout uh, Texas. The, uh, they have a, a very broad range, um, pretty much from the east coast to west coast, all the way down into Florida. Once you get outside of Texas, um, uh, they're, they're, most people refer to them as Brazilian free tail bats. Um, it's the bat here in Texas that we call them Mexican free tail bats, but it's basically the same species of bat. So all the way up into southern parts of uh, Missouri, Kansas. Uh, so they have a very wide range uh, here in the United States and throughout Mexico. Uh, they are migratory, so they move up into the Texas hill country and then spread out through east coast and west coast. Uh, they start migrating right now uh, mid-February. We're actually over the last decade um, the bats have been coming back earlier and earlier and and uh, with, the, with the warmer and warmer winters that we're, we're having. So, um, so we'll start seeing bats typically around Valentine's Day um, here in the last couple of years. Uh, and they're here um, to have their babies and raise their babies uh, in the caves that we have here and throughout Texas. The, um, <clears throat> also, so they're here all summer long, and then they're going to move back 
to Mexico where it's warmer, uh, and they're spread out all over Mexico. There's no just one place that they all go to. The colonies that we have in Texas are made up of thousands of smaller colonies that have migrated from either a cave, abandoned mine, a bridge, hydroelectric dams, buildings, and throughout Mexico, they've migrated to Texas, uh, roosting in our caves, roosting in our bridges and buildings and whatnot. And, um, and then they turn around and like I said, once we get that really good cold snap around Thanksgiving, they will move back south for the, for the winter. Um, the, uh, to kind of give you an idea what one of them looks like, this is a Mexican free tail bat. So they're, um, they're not really, not, not that big of a bat. They are very narrow wings. So a Mexican free tail bat are our flat, fastest um, animal. They've been clocked at 98 miles an hour in powered flight. So the, the, uh, that narrow winged shape they have uh, makes for uh, very fast flying. This is about an eight to 10 inch wingspan. Um, they, uh, their body size is just barely three inches. So if you were to take your two thumbs and put in your two hands to your two thumbs together, um, that's about how big their bodies are. Uh, they weigh, you know, 15 grams, which is um, like as much as two quarters, barely half an ounce. Um, and again, these are a colony bat. They roost in these large colonies um, you're looking at around 500 bats per square foot in, in, in a lot of these colonies uh, that we have. So they, uh, they do like each other's company. Uh, to kind of give you a sense of how big they are, uh, in this picture, you have a big brown bat um, right there. And then right next to it is a adult Mexican free tail bat. So you can see like it's about a third as big as a, a big brown bat. This is a cave in Texas uh, where we just happened to have uh, multiple species of bats roosting together and um, probably roosting right up against that big brown bat to stay warm. Um, but uh, so you kind of kind of get a sense of how how small these bats are compared to some of the other species of bats that we have. Um, so we did talk about the um, the cave being a maternity roost for Mexican free tail bats. So uh, the females, most a lot of the mating goes on uh, prior to their uh, migrating, but we do have overwintering populations um, in the US and Texas. So uh, there is some mating going on as well at the, and with those overwintering populations. Um, they have one baby bat each, uh, which a baby bat's called a pup. So you can see in that picture, that is a newborn baby uh, Mexican free tail bat that had fallen off of its uh, off of its mother, and uh, somebody asked, actually rescued it at the Congress Avenue Bridge. So yeah, they're really tiny and hairless when they're first born, actually for the first few weeks. So um, the uh, so what happened when the mommy when she has her baby, she literally hangs by her thumb, uh, cups her tail, baby bat pops out, crawls up on her chest and hangs on the nipple is kind of up under her wing uh, and the baby will hang on to the nipple and hang on to her fur. And because uh, she's going to go out and forage for food while that baby is clinging to her chest. And that will go on for um, about 10 days. They grow very fast. The mothers are generating their body weight and milk every day for their young. So they grow very fast. And eventually that baby's going to get too big, too heavy for the mother to carry. So then she's going to deposit those babies in these nursery sections throughout the cave. Uh, there's about four of them in Bracken. And when you look up in those pots to the ceiling, the ceiling, those sections of ceiling are pink. Normally they'll be, be black where the adults are, but where the babies are roosting, it's pink because they're still hairless for a few weeks. So we just have these pink spots um, and they can't fly. <clears throat> but they do crawl around. So in some of the studies we've done, they've actually moved, can move, will move up to about 10 feet away from where they were last time the mother nursed her young. <clears throat> so she's able to find her baby amongst all those thousands of other baby bats using scent and sound. So she knows what her boy baby's uh, voice sounds like, 
and also what her baby smells like. So she'll call out to the baby and as she's flying around and the baby calls back. So she kind of triangulates where the baby is and then literally lands on that mass of bats and sniffs around until uh, she can find her young and nurse it. <clears throat> so if we lose the, the mother bat to a predator uh, while they're out foraging, we're also going to lose um, that baby as well because there won't be another bat to, uh, to nurse it. Um, and this goes on till the babies are about um, four and a half, five weeks old. Um, they'll start flying. The mothers will still nurse them a little bit. Um, but once they're about eight to 10 weeks old, at that point, uh, they're weaned and they're on their own. So that'll be right around uh, the third week of August um, is when, uh, when the, our, we see our, our juveniles at that point are, are on their own and moving, moving on. So <clears throat> the, um, the bats roost, of course, in different, different spaces. Uh, caves is the most common uh, space that people are familiar with. Uh, same way with Mexican free-tailed bats. They'll roost in a lot of the caves that we have in the area. Um, uh, there's, if you go to our website, backon.org, there's information about bat viewing at different bat cave sites throughout the Texas Hill Country. So you, if you want to go out and catch, catch a bat flight somewhere, um, bottom left-hand corner is actually a, a man-made cave. There's two man-made caves in Texas. Uh, there's one at James J. David Mamberger's ranch, Sela, uh, near Johnson City. He was the first um, man-made cave to be built and to have bats in it. And then there's another one down near the Three Rivers area, um, uh, south of uh, uh, Jardington. Um, that's another man-made cave that uh, the bats have uh, just started moving into it in the last year, year and a half. So they built it about five or six years ago. Um, so, uh, so you can have the wherewithal to build a cave and the bats will come at some point and find it. Um, also the Mexican free tail bats roost in a lot of our bridges uh, throughout the Texas. So top right hand corner is uh, of course all Congress Avenue bridge in Austin. Um, that's about a million and a half. It's the largest urban colony of bats. Um, <clears throat> on the bottom right, that's Wall Street bridge in uh, Houston. A uh, few hundred thousand, uh, and uh, here in San Antonio, we have uh, the top left is uh, Vance Jackson and I-10. There's uh, probably a hundred thousand or so bats roosting in there, and they're roosting in those uh, expansion joints. So we get to see a picture uh, that bottom left-hand corner. You can see uh, the urine staining on the, in that expansion joint. So that's where the bats are roosting. Uh, the picture on the right. Top right shows you uh, how the bats are clustered there, there together. Uh, you're looking at around 200 bats per linear foot. Those crevice, those expansion joints, crevices, they're about three quarters to an inch wide, uh, anywhere from eight to 10 inches, 12 inches deep. And so the bats will be tucked up in there, a couple hundred bats per linear foot in, in those bridge roofs. Um, the, uh, one of the other roosts uh, everybody knows are bat houses. Uh, so that's a really common um, place for bats, many different species of bats to roost. In the center, you can kind of see um, uh, two bat houses back to back. Um, best way to put them is up on a pole like that, 12 to 15 feet up in the air out in full sun. If you look on the right hand side, <clears throat> you can see the arrows pointing at a person standing on one of the support beams for a camp, that's a Campbell's bat house. <clears throat> These were all over the Gulf Coast area in the early 1900s. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they were put out for um, mosquito control um, because of uh, the um, big, big problems with mosquitoes. So they put these large bat houses all along the Gulf Coast uh, down into Florida uh, to help control insects. Um, there's a book out there uh, if you want to really do a deep dive into them, but it's on Campbell's Bat Houses. Um, and they would harvest the guano out from underneath it um, to, uh, to use as a fertilizer. 
Um, guano has been harvested from, from bat caves for hundreds of years, including bracken. Hundreds of tons of guano would be taken out every year and used as a fertilizer and also in gunpowder production. So if you happen to be in Landa Park over in New Braunfels, over where the spring is, you have the spring there on the cliff on the right hand side. Over to the left, a few hundred yards, you'll see some old stone structures. That's part of uh, where they used to, these old vats that they would, uh, stone vats that they would build. They would wagon train the guano from Bracken or Bremer Cave, which is between just out just west of New Braunfels. And they would dump that guano into these large stone vats, divert water out of the spring into those vats. And the water would leach, you know, flow through the guano, leach the nitrates out of the, uh, out of the guano, and then dry in the lower vats. The sun would basically let the water evaporate and they would have saltpeter or the nitrate crystals that they would use for gunpowder production. So that went on through all through the Civil War era and up into uh, World War One. So, um, so some of the just different unique things about the Mexican free tail bats and these um, large colonies they have. If you happen to be uh, in the downtown Bernie visiting where the old city jail is, <clears throat> you are able to uh, stop in there and see they have a display up where they re, um, made replicas of uh, bat bombs. So during World War II, Mexican free pilled bats were uh, being used. There was uh, this experiment, so to speak, going on to, uh, to create these bombs that they would drop out of airplanes. And uh, so you kind of think of, it's kind of like uh, uh, these cylinder bombs with these trays in them and they would put the bats, cool the bats down, put them in there, and they would attach little napalm packets to them with little timers on them. And then they would drop these out of an airplane and uh, the parachute would open and they'd drift down. And as it drifted down, the sides would pop off and the bats would warm up and fly away and trigger the timer. And the idea was that they would go roost under houses and uh, and then explode, go and then start fires. Um, fortunately for the bats, the uh, it did work. They did burn down some buildings at the uh, at the Air Force Base where they were testing it here in Texas. But um, they came up with the atom bomb and used that instead, so it saved the bats from having to to go through all that. Um, so that's just a little history about the Mexican free tail bats in Texas. Um, so. When we look at some of the other uh, foraging uh, habits with the with the bats, um, you know we see these large swarms of bats. Uh, some of the historical records, uh, people thought that the it was that they were smoke, and that's actually how they found some of these caves. They would follow that smoke in the sky, what they thought was smoke in the sky, and find uh, these caves in the in throughout the area. The um, but the, you can actually uh, see these emergences on Doppler radar. So here's a couple of different Doppler radar slides, images um, and during the evenings here. Um, the one on the left is uh, just taken off of an app that I have on my phone. And you can see the, the green and the blue popping up in all different places along uh, I-10 and I-35. And up, you, you can even see uh, uh, the Chiroptorium up at uh, Bamberger's place there at Sela, and the old Tunnel State Park out near Comfort. Um, so you can see all these different bat roosts popping up. Frio Cave on the on the right hand side, Eckert James River up near Mason. So you can see all these different uh, caves uh, of bat colonies from these caves popping up in the evenings um, on the Doppler radar. So it's uh, something, and sometimes with the local news, they'll actually go show them. Now, bats have a lot of different predators that they have to deal with. Um, so when, they, when we have an emergence at Bracken Cave, we, at, which is the mouth of the cave is the bottom of a sinkhole, the, uh, the predators will come into that space uh, basically to catch bats for dinner. So now near the mouth of the cave, we can have everything from rattlesnakes to western coach whip snakes uh, oh, hanging from the rock ceiling at the mouth of the cave. We'll have our Texas rat snakes. 
um, and they're okay catching bats because they're within inches of the ground as they emerge from these caves. Overhead, the uh, raptors will come in. So red tail hawks, red shoulders hawks, peregrine falcons, uh, Swainson's hawks. Uh, while we have light, when it gets dark, um, then we'll start seeing the um, gray horned owls will come in. Uh, other predators that uh, will come into the cave area are, include ring tailed cats, uh, raccoons, skunks, gray fox, coyotes. So all of those predators will come into the cave areas uh, to catch bats, um, both in the evenings as they emerge and in the mornings as they emerge. Um, the, uh, so uh, we're going to talk briefly about some of the threats that our Mexican free tail bats um, uh, have to are having here in Texas. Uh, the biggest threat here in Texas right now is um, our wind turbine, wind farms, wind turbines, just killing hundreds of thousands of bats um, in, when, uh, as they fly through these uh, land, uh, well, through through the landscape, being hit by the the blades on these turbines. So that's a big, uh, big problem. Um, and then another big problem we have is climate change. And it really uh, uh, showed itself this past winter. Um, so over the last decade, as our winters have gotten warmer, uh, more and more bats have uh, become what we call, call overwintering. So they're not migrating away uh, south where it's to Mexico where it's warmer. And some of those bats stay in the cave. So for, for example, Bracken will have about, uh, now we're up to around 100,000 bats that overwinter. I mean, just, you know, five, six years ago, it was only about 5,000, but it's slowly increasing. Um, but, our, but our bridge roofs, um, we're seeing tens of thousands of bats that will overwinter in these bridge roofs. And in normal circumstances, we do get enough breaks in the cold weather to where these bats can come out and forage for food. Pretty much if it's over 40, 45 degrees, there are bugs out on the landscape for these, for these bats to, uh, to forage for. Uh, this past winter with the, with the freeze that we had, um, besides the fact that it was significantly lower, temp below freezing temperatures for a long period of time, um, these images are from our bridge roosting bats. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, we lost tens of thousands. We have really have not even finished calculating how many bats we lost at uh, pretty much every bridge roost uh, that ha we have. Um, we had uh, significant die off of, of the bats. So if you like Wimberley, um, tens of thousands of bats. Uh, Austin, uh, all, all up and down the uh, I-35 corridor, uh, Interstate 10, um, uh, tens of thousands of bats basically froze to death. So, uh, so th that is a, a direct root cause of, of the global warming shifts in climate. And so the bats have, have shifted their behavior and then the climate shifts again and they get caught off guard. So. Uh, those are some of the biggest concerns we have uh, with for them. Now, the but bats, we get a lot of benefits from bats. Just the Mexican free tail bats alone. If you look at the ecosystem services, um, for the, for example, the bats at Bracken Cave eat 147 tons of bugs a night. So from March until November, they're eating 147. That's this just an unbelievable amount of insects that these bats are consuming. And for just, for example, just our cotton farmers alone, that's worth about $800,000 a season in crop damage that's prevented um, or pesticides that they don't have to purchase and spray on their crops. So, you know, that, so there, there's an economic benefit to, uh, to the farmers. Uh, and then there's also an environmental benefit to us because they're not spraying those chemicals on their crops and it's getting down into the into our drinking water and whatnot. So, and also too, our Mexican free tail bats um, are a big part of ecotourism. Um, you know, Austin, you know, has Austin Bat Fest, Tex you know, San Antonio has Bat Loco downtown near the Pearl. Um, 
So those those are attract a lot of tourism dollars. Uh, Austin alone um, is worth about 11 to 14 million dollars a year in tax revenue for people that have traveled to Austin uh, to see bat flights in at Austin. And then you look at the other bat roosts that we have, for example, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Old Tunnel State Park. Um, somewhere between 28 to 30,000 people a year visit uh, visit that uh, roost there. Uh, so um, lots of, and you know, there's restaurants and whatnot around that benefit from all that. So lots of uh, lots of benefits to bats uh, to for for people for because of the bats that we have here in the Texas Hill Country. Um, so. Uh, now we've uh, hopefully we've got some questions. If anybody has any questions, now's your chance. Um, so we do, we? do. yes, Good. Um, we definitely started uh, pouring in. So um, a lot of people are wondering about about this past freeze, um, and you you've answered that. Um, I was wondering if if those bats that died were they the overwintering population? They wouldn't have been the migrating population returned yet. Is that right? Sort of, yeah. So we it was so most of them were the um, overwintering population, but it also was around the time when we started getting um, the bats had started migrating. So we don't know um, how much of an effect it did on the migrating bats. Now, for example, at Bracken, the temperatures not never got the lowest temperature we had at Bracken Cave during that time period was 37 degrees. So in, the cave roosts are well insulated. That and 75 feet of guano generates a lot of heat as it decomposes. So, so that was able to keep those caves warm. Where we did have other caves in in the area where you know it, water froze inside the caves. So that could have been could have been an issue for. For our non-hibernating bats, but it was right around that time. But we're our best guess is it was mostly our overwintering populations that were affected. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, early on, somebody asked about the population of Bracken Cave, which I think you said is about 20 million. Right. Yeah, somewhere around 15 to 20 million. It's kind of funny how you round up five million, but <laughs> um, yeah. So the um, it's really hard to count them. Uh, it's been a number of years since we attempted to count them, but we do we do count them regularly with uh, using thermal cameras. Now we can videotape the emergence stream and run that through a software program uh, that literally will count the hot pixels and give us a, give, yes. an, give us a pretty good estimate of how many bats. So we're looking at around eight to ten million bats, female bats, and then once they have their young. That gets us up to around the 20 million mark. Right, and it, it is the largest bat population in the world. Right, Lar and it's also the largest concentration of mammals inside of five acres. Oh wow! Because the footprint of the cave is about five acres. So now, uh, it, uh, now there's more than 20 much, million people in Mexico City. It's much smaller than I realized the cave. Um, People are wondering, and, and I was wondering too from that, uh, I don't know if it was a photo or a diagram you showed at the beginning, but it looked like there were two entrances into Bracken Cave, is that correct? Right, so what we had is, let me zip back to that one. There it is, yeah, our profile, yeah. So we have our natural en entrance there on the right-hand side, which is a sinkhole. Basically the ceiling collapsed and uh, caved in. So. If you were to, uh, if you follow the line of the cave, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, so you follow the line, there's more cave as my cursor goes down below here, 60 feet down. But when, this, the, when the ceiling collapsed, it buried all this portion of the cave under the right. debris. Okay. So, um, and then over here on the left, that is a, a man-made, a shaft that was dug um, in the early 1900s uh, to expedite the mining of the guano. So what they would go do is they'll go into the cave and bag up the guano and haul it up out out of the hole here. So um, 
and that that's a pretty steep climb and it gets pretty old after a while so they dug a hole in so they could bag the guano in the back and winch it out okay. um, up there and there's some old buildings as part of the old mining operation and then they would and the and the, the cave's original name was Cibolo cave because of its proximity to Cibolo creek right. it picked up the name bracken because of the town that's about 13 miles away called of bracken which is where the railroad stop was, where the guano was hauled to, because right. it was uh, rail it was railroaded down to uh, Houston and exported. So that's how it picked up the name Bracken. Right. Um, so, do you guys know how long bats have been utilizing Bracken Cave? Yeah. So our best guess is between eighty five hundred and ten thousand years. Okay. We're basing that on over in Natural Bridge Caverns, which was discovered in 1961 and, and, and opened to the surface at that point. It was a tiny crawl space. One of the things they found in there was some uh, an old guano mound. Um, and so a core sample that was taken and carbon dated, and it came back to be around 8,500 to 10,000 years. So um, our guess is whatever tectonics happened that caved in natural so that meant natural bridge caverns had bats living in it at some point but then it was something there was a cave in and it was sealed off to the surface um and then at some point bracken uh we had the cave in and it was opened up to the surface so and in the very back whoops the very back of the cave the very back room of the cave um is ended by a fault bat cave fault where my cursor is so there's a fault right there that okay. uh ended that portion of the cave and also ended uh natural bridge caverns we, we, we share the same fault okay um i was surprised to see that one photo you showed of a free-tailed bat with a big brown bat Did, does that do you see that often um and, and also um, about how many different species do we find, you know, in our mm -hmm. part of the world of bats? Right, so the U.S. has 47 different species of bats. Texas has 32. Oh, I heard that, yeah. Of 47, yes. Yeah. So we have, of course, we have the largest diversity of species of bats in the, in the U.S. And yeah. so in the Texas Hill Country, we have about seven different species of bats. Um, the, and many of our hibernating bats, big brown, our cave myotis, our tricolor bats, our Townsend big eared bats, those bats will hibernate in, in the caves that we have. And so they're spending, you know, and so and they will, multiple species of bats will use the same cave to hibernate in, but they like different temperatures. So they'll be in different places. So like the Townsend's big eared bats, they like a lot of airflow for some reason, so they hibernate near the entrances to the caves, that first 25, 30 feet, that's where we'll find them. Um, mm -hmm. Big browns, they're usually up in the middle. Um, and, and and so those bats are using the cave, hibernating in the cave, and some of them are there during the summer months. So this picture was taken during the summer months when we had the Mexican free tail bats had migrated back into that area and were roosting in that same cave during the summer um, right. a, as a maternity colony and the and the big browns and the townsends and the and the, and the cave myotis were all still using that cave but different right. places in the cave right it gets a little tight <laughs> yeah i guess it can get crowded but they have all have their space um yeah. except for we're not sure if the Big Brown thought it was a Mexican free tail or the Mexican free tail thought it was a big brown, but. Right, yeah. Um, I, I loved your historical photos showing like how humans have interacted with bats in the past. Um, like that, that giant, um, that giant man-made bat structure. Right, yeah, um, the Campbell's bat house, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I was wondering, cause I thought I had heard that um, in actuality, bats do not eat mosquitoes. They don't offer enough 
you know, protein or mass or, you know, what have you. Do you know if that's true or not? It's one of those ones that's sort of true. Um, yeah. So Mexican free t different species will eat kind of if you think of like from the ground to 10,000 feet as a buffet table. And so there are certain insects knee high to the ground and there's other insects that are up in the trees. And of course, there are other insects up at 10,000 feet. So the Mexican free tail bat, based on their wing design and body shape, they're up there at that 10,000 foot level, feeding on these insect swarms that are moving from crop to crop. Right. Um, whereas our tricolor bat um, or our evening bat, which are, have a shorter kind of boxier wing, so they're more maneuverable closer to the ground or above the trees or out over some grassy areas. So they're gonna target different species of insects when they're, when they're out foraging. Um, sure. But for the most part, if, if the bat is flying along and a mosquito's right there, it's gonna grab it, but it's not gonna hunt down a mosquito just right. because of the energy output to catch that little old bug, it just doesn't make right. sense. So, and, and also too, a lot of our biting, you know, the mosquitoes that we deal with, like our tiger mosquitoes, those guys are out during the day and early right. evening right. Yeah. biting us, not yeah. usually out when the bats are out. Yeah, and they're probably staying a lot lower to the ground because that's that's where the mammals are. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, so the study that was done with mosquitoes, uh, they had the only thing in the flight cage for the bats to eat was mosquitoes. <laughs> so... You know, they've been around for 52 million years. They're a little bit smarter than we give them credit for. They were right. going to eat the mosquitoes instead of starve to death. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, is guano still harvested at Bracken Cave? Uh, no, we stopped harvesting the guano in 2009 because just... of the... So back then, white nose syndrome was, was a problem. Uh, the fungus, we didn't know a lot about it. Also, we didn't have really good ways of testing for it, really quick ways of testing for it. And so, uh, and the guano that was being harvested out of Bracken up until 2009 was shipped all over the US in bulk as a fertilizer. So they would load a rail car, ship it out to California, and they spread it all over the orchards out there. So because we didn't have a really good understanding of the fungus and a way of testing yeah. for it we stopped the mining of the guano and at the end of the day it really didn't generate that much money on on our end i mean it's the more the money's made on the retail end um so but yeah so up but up until 2009 um they were pulling we were pulling out around 100 tons a year Wow. out of the cave and that was done the har the harvesting the guano was done during the winter months when the bats weren't in the there. weren't in the cave so and right. also the cave will air out because caves breathe so yeah. then it would be safe it would be safe for the for the miners to go into the cave and right. uh, and right. harvest the guano okay i got you um there were some questions about the wind turbines i know the Audubon Society and other groups are um, doing experiments and trying to find ways to protect birds from wind turbines. Um, can you talk about any of those efforts or technologies uh, being made for bats? Right, yeah, so we have uh, helped develop a, basically these acoustic deterrents and they're actually being field tested in Texas and other places, Texas, Hawaii, some other places. Um, so these 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 uh, acoustic devices that are actually mounted on the on the nacelle of the turbine, and to emit these ultrasonic sound waves that basically scare the bats away from the away from the turbine. Okay. Um, so um, the uh, so that's being that's being done, worked on. It's we're being field tested. So um, they just finished some studies this past uh, couple last couple months ago here in Texas, and so now it's a matter of crunching all the data um, sure. to see. And, and actually, we we're we're moving now to uh, to the the turbines that are out 
over the ocean and and trying to and studying them is what we're working on now so um, there are there are things we can do the most efficient thing to do uh, with when it comes to turbines for bats is um, is is the cut in speed so um, when the when the wind is blowing really over 10 miles an hour 15 miles an hour um, that is just really too windy for bats to be catching insects um, so and so but but underneath that is when the bats are foraging doing their most of their foraging and also that's when the wind turbines are only generating a couple percentages of the of the energy that they would normally generate but they're turning anyway and because the, the, so uh, we're working with the wind industry to actually um, to uh, f you can feather the blades on the turbine so they don't cut in until like 10 miles an hour or more um, so that when the bats are for the primary time for bats to forage for food uh, the turbine the blades aren't moving um, and so they're not getting hit with it. just doing that can reduce the fatalities by over by 90 to 95 percent on these wind farms oh, wow. so that is the biggest thing yeah. but um, the uh, with hopefully with the newer technology on the turbines that can be automated right now to do that you got to run out to each turbine and tweak it um, which doesn't make any sense so yeah yeah but, that, but yeah there's a lot of stuff going on right now for wind right. turbines um well people they want to know um what they can do themselves um to protect our local bat populations and um, I'd also like to ask you about uh, volunteering at Bracken Cave as well, because I imagine there's lots of us that would be interested in that. Right. So, uh, you know, volunteering at Bracken Cave, you can contact me and um, we have, you know, everything from all kinds of bio blitzes, bird surveys, plant, all kinds of survey work that we do. Um, uh, we also have plenty of backbreaking work to do. Um, I've I have 1500 uh, 1500 acres and uh, so we need we need cedar stuff work done and controlled burns and that kind of stuff so we have a little bit of everything and then uh, and also we've got a lot of public outreach work that we do as well that we can use volunteers for so you can reach reach me at, at batcon.org um, and uh, let me put my uh, I think I have my but uh, you know, then, I don't, I don't actually know if uh, if working out at uh, Bracken Cave is an approved activity for our local chapter. Do it you know? should, I believe it is for Alamo area. Yes. Okay. okay yeah, cool. it should be. Yeah, it should be approved. If it's not, we can fix that. Um, right. But yeah, so there's that to do. As far as generally speaking, for bats, um, just the f knowing how good bats are and the benefits we from and sharing that with people yeah. is you know because there's a lot of you know bats get a really bad rap especially from hollywood so letting people know that you know they're not the scary monster things blood sucking creatures that right. they're as they're projected on tv so that's right. one um you know so becoming a member of, of bat conservation international and supporting us that way um, helps with all any number of our research projects and work that we do all over the world. Um, so there's that that you can do. We, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so you can you know join us all through that way. Um, so that and then you know just pollinator gardens are beneficial to bats. And you know they eat those nighttime bugs that go to the gardens. Um, so uh, those those type of things um are, be are beneficial as well and then like i said if you if you're part of if, if you go to if you join bci or not even join bci but if you if you get on our email feeds or our twitter feeds uh, sometimes we need help uh, like um you know with, with the uh the rawa act with the recovery of american wildlife that funding that's trying to go through congress letting your congressman know that that's important to you Mm -hmm. um, because that that funding is gonna one is gonna protect habitat um, eventually, 
uh, it's going to fund research. Um, so and so any and any time we can protect bat habitat, just any all of our projects include, you know, habitat. It's not just protecting the cave. We're also protecting the habitat around it and the water sources and all those things. So all the other wildlife benefits as well. Right, of course. And there's also bat friendly tequila. So that's a really fun way of helping bats. Uh, you, can go, <laughs> you can go to our website. There's information on the bat friendly tequila. Um, so helping, help, you know, cause there's, you know, the popularity of tequila is yeah. negatively impacting bats. Well, you mentioned that um, you guys have a project where you're planting agaves, right? Right. And is that just because that's bat habitat and it's, you know, being harvested? Or Yeah, so well, what we're losing is because of the popularity of tequila, um, more and more farmers are planting a monoculture of yeah. agave. Yeah. And so in, when they're doing that, they're, we're losing that wild space. So that, not just the agave for our bats, but the entire yeah. landscape is being bulldozed to plant agaves. And then that plant takes 12 to 18 years to mature. Mm -hmm. So this is a long term negative impact on the environment. And it's harvested before it flowers. So the the bats don't get any benefit from that. So the bat friendly tequila, uh, those farmers have agreed to percent of like 5% of their agave will be allowed to mature and bloom. Um, some of the areas where um, they're, they're putting in it as fence lines, you know, agave is a hell a great barrier. It's better than barbed wire right. and, uh, and allow those to bloom. And then we're also, uh, able to collect seed from these wild spaces. We've got nurseries that are growing the agave. And once yeah. they're about five years old, we can plant them in areas. Um, right. The stuff, so, so there's projects like that that, uh, that we're doing. Well, yeah. And you know, everybody knows that agaves, if they're growing in your, your yard or your garden, that they just pop out constantly. And yeah. Uh, it would be so easy to pop those up and they don't, they don't grow very fast, but you know, then donate them. Um, well, I, we, yeah, but those are, those are non-native agaves. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, those are the, those, a lot of those in our yards are ornamental agaves, unless you happen to be out West Texas or parts of Mexico. I see. Okay. So there's only two species of native agave that, uh -huh. um, that the bats get the, 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 the biggest bang for the buck. So that's what we're, that's what we're, oh, okay. we're, we're targeting those native species. Cause the ones that we have around here are ornamental agave. So they're from Does somewhere. Does that else. include the Americana or the, the blue agave? No, there's, there's one, there's one of the blue agaves is um, there's, there's 200 and I think 50 species of agave uh -huh. in different parts of the U S Mexico. Right. So, yeah, so some of the blue agaves are native as well. Uh -huh. uh, it just, but most of the ones I'm not. The, personally, I can't tell one apart from the other, but <laughs> right. the, the agave people can, <laughs> and they've tried to teach me, and I just it still looks like the other one <laughs> to yeah. me. But yeah. yeah, and some of them flower have a different type of flower, and it's easier for the sure. bats to, to forage on it. Sure. Yeah. Um. Well, back to bad Hollywood movies. Um, we do have a question about what types of diseases we, that could be transmitted to us from bats. Um, one woman pointed out that um, when she was visiting bat caves in other states, they were asked if they'd been in a bat cave anywhere else in the last 90 days. And they asked them to put um, covers over their shoes and and maybe that's more about um you know the fungus that causes white nose syndrome um i'm not i'm not sure but she was also wondering um what diseases can be transferred to humans or what can we carry you know between bat populations maybe not even just being carriers right yeah so the first part of that is the, the other the, the walking through the bleach solution to go into like mammoth cave or one of those other show caves 
that is uh, trying to slow down the spread of the fungus that causes whiteness in here. Sure. So that's what that's targeting. As yeah. far as in the US, um, from a bat, the biggest thing you have to worry about if you're handling a bat, you find a bat and you're handling it, could be rabies. Right. Um, other than that, the um, going into caves, there's uh, a, the fungus histoplasmosis, which a hu human could could get, and that could you know make you really really sick. So so that environment has funguses that that aren't nice to the human body. Now as far as for example, like coronavirus, the the COVID-19 is a human to human transmission. You cannot get COVID-19 from a bat. Now the research is still out and it's going to be a number of years before they really know what's going on. But the coronavirus is, there are species of bats that carry the coronaviruses. So the biggest problem we have is is humans moving into that that ha the the an wild animals habitat, and the fact that they're eating these the animals and and ha handling these animals with practically zero sanitation is right. um, is the big problem. So um, for any any kind of diseases that can be from one, from wildlife to humans, yeah. so that's the problem. Um, yeah, the the habitat destruction and just the handling or just bush meat in general. Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a, know, it's a big problem for yeah. all kinds of species of animals yeah. right. all, all over the world. So, right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but you can't get COVID-19 from a bat. You can only right. get it from another person. Um, right. And uh, it's, you know, it's going to be a while before we know exactly where the coronavirus that causes it, COVID-19 where how that moved from whatever yeah. animal it moved into before it moved into a human it's going to be a while before we know that right right um well listen Fran thank you so much for this uh, no problem really great talk and I know our participants are really interested and you know hopefully this is gonna um further some some volunteer opportunities you know, um, for our members and, and get more people involved uh, at Bracken Cave. So um, this has just been a great talk. Thank you so much. Not a problem. And hopefully we'll see you guys out at the at the, at the preserve. Um, we've, like I said, we've lots of birding, lots to do. Right. Lots of fun stuff to do. Not it's not all work. <laughs> not just. <carrying laughs> it's not just it's not just <laughs> chainsaws and shovels. Work. Right. Right. A lot yeah. of fun stuff to do. Right. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much. Getting lots of thank you messages from uh, the participants as well. So. Not a problem. I'm, um, thank you for the invitation. And uh, okay. I just hope to see you all again.